My guest today is Tim Barton. Tim is the president of Wall Builders. Um, I, I've been a fan of the Bartons and Wall Builders for a long time because I'm a history buff and very much believe that our history is a part of the faith story of our nation. Mm -hmm. So, Tim, welcome to Middle Tennessee. And Pastor Jackson, thanks for having me and good to be with you. Pastor Jackson's great, but I work for Alan too. It's okay either way. So, <laughs> um, Tell the people a little bit about what Wall Builders is and what you do and how long you've been around because I, I know they want to check that out. Yeah, so Wall Builders is a organization. We are based in Texas. And uh, the name has become a little uh, convoluted and confusing for some people after President Trump wanted to build a wall. Uh, we don't have anything to do with building walls. It actually is a name that we took from the Bible book of Nehemiah, where Nehemiah, for, for those listening that remember, he was part of the Israeli captivity and he was a cupbearer to the king. And, and he's the one that God impressed on his heart to go rebuild the walls of his own nation. And Nehemiah is a story of a grassroots movement of the people waking up, of them coming back together and then rebuilding and restoring their nation to some extent. And my dad back in the 80s just really felt that was a call of God on his life, looking at America, seeing even in the 80s, the, the attacks on the kind of the religious and the moral foundation of the nation, the attacks on the Constitution. And he felt that God called him to be like a Nehemiah and to start calling people to come, let's rebuild the walls. And Nehemiah 2.11, it says, come, let us rebuild the walls that we may no longer be reproached. So that was the idea. And, and a lot of the rebuilding was literally going back to saying, let's get back to the constitution, to the bill of rights, to, to these God-given rights the founding fathers recognized. He began collecting founders' writings. Uh, we now have what's considered the largest private collection of original documents from the founding era. So we actually have letters from George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and right, all these notable founding fathers. Uh, and so as we study history, you know, that the narratives today so often are so incorrect and, and sometimes very intentionally so, because there's people that are trying to change the, the foundation of the nation. If, if you want America to be a socialist nation, you need to remove the constitution. Part of how you do that is you have to villainize all the founding fathers. And if you can villainize them, then the constitution also can be bad. And then we get rid of the constitution become so. So, so there's been some very intentional efforts for it. What we're able to do is when people are making claims or accusations, we can go back to their actual writings and say, well, here's what they actually said about this. And we have those actual letters and books and documents. So we spend a lot of time doing things on the educational front. We work with a lot of churches, a lot of pastors. We do a lot of things with a lot of uh, schools. We do a lot of work with state legislators as well, even with congressmen and senators trying to protect and restore the constitution, as well as restore the biblical foundation of the nation. Wonderful. I want to say thank you because uh, I earned one degree in history and I know what's being taught generally today in the public square is not a very accurate reflection of the story of our nation. Mm -hmm. And what you and wall builders are doing and have been doing is such a wonderful attempt to tell that story so that people know. So I, I just want to start out with that huge thank you. Thank you. Well, let's take one that I, I hear. I read it again this week that our founders were deists that so many of those who signed the declaration were deists, they were not Christians. Um, I, I have my own answer, but since I have an expert here, I'm gonna let you give yours. What would your response to that be? Well, th and this is a claim we hear quite often, and, and really we can go back to the fact, to give kind of the 30,000 foot view, um, the founding fathers have been criticized and demonized for 60 years. Uh, I mean, really going back to the 1960s, you see this start by the 60s and 70s. The accusations against them were the founding fathers were sexually immoral people, uh, that they were, you know, adulterers, philanderers, what have you. In the Scoundrels. Eight, right. Yeah. In the 80s and 90s, it turned into they weren't really religious people. Uh, they were atheists, agnostics, and deists. This is when you heard a lot of the separation of church and state argument enter the scene, um, that the founding fathers wanted a secular government, a secular nation. And then in the 2000s and the 2010s is when you've seen the shift now to the accusation they were all racist slaveholders and really evil men, et cetera. The, the reason this context I think matters is if you look for 60 years, this has all been an, a, an attempt to villainize the founding fathers. But if you take any of the accusations, wh whether we talk about the, the sexually immoral or the deist or the people who own slaves, the fundamental question for any of this is, well, which ones the founding fathers did, right? So if we're going to say, well, the, the accusation people say is, well, they weren't religious, that, that we know they were deists. They didn't really believe in Jesus. Well, well which ones? And this, this is very important because there were 56 signers of the declaration. Uh, 
There were 55 founding fathers that framed the Constitution. 39 signed the Constitution. There were 90 founding fathers who were part of the first Congress when the Bill of Rights was drafted. Altogether, it's more than 200 individuals in this founding father genre. And we haven't even gotten to guys like Patrick Henry, who was an early governor, or other military officers who weren't a signer of the Declaration of Constitution or part of the first Congress. So there's, there's about 250 we'd call founding fathers. And the reason it matters is if we're going to say the accusation is they were all deists, well, how many can we name? Because most people can't name more than four or five founding fathers. In fact, of the 56 signers of the Declaration, it's a game I love to play. Uh, when I travel and speak in high schools or even colleges, I will put up the picture of the 56 signers of the Declaration. And actually my backpack I have behind me, I travel with a $10 Chick-fil-A gift card. And I will pull out my $10 Chick-fil-A gift card and say, if anybody can point out five of these signers of the Declaration, you can have this $10 Chick-fil-A gift card. And, and for seven years, I have not given away a $10 Chick-fil-A gift card because most of us don't know who they were. And w the reason this context matters is it's, it's easy to believe a lie if you don't know the truth. And so if we don't know who the founding fathers were, then, then we maybe don't know their position on faith. And so let's go back to this deist thought. So there were 56 individuals that signed the declaration. Only one of them ever self-ascribed to be a deist. One of them claimed, one, that they were a deist. That individual was Benjamin Franklin. But what's worth noting is Benjamin Franklin makes this claim in his autobiography. Now, it's, again, worth noting because people can go look up and you can read his autobiography even online right now. You can go to Google Books, look up the Franklin autobiography and, and search for the word deist. And what you will find is he says, when I was 15 years old, I began listening to some of these deistic thinkers and they were making the argument for why Christianity maybe was not the most logical thing. He said, then I listened to several pastors argue in favor of Christianity and why it was the most logical thing. He said, and it occurred to me, the position of the deist was stronger than that of the pastors. He said, so I determined I would be a deist. He said, upon further consideration, however, it occurred to me that although deism might be true in some points, that the belief itself would be of no benefit to me and of no use to anyone else, so I quickly left that belief behind. Now, that's the only founding father who ever self-ascribed to deism, and it was Franklin when he was 15 years old, and in the same place where he said he was a deist, the same place he said he was 15, became a deist, he says, and then he quickly realized, so I don't know if that means like a week and a half later, right? I don't know how long he was a deist, but it wasn't very long, but this is where today so many people make the claim that they're deist, and we would just say, well, well, what source do you have? What what proof do you have? And and today, some people would say, well, because they use words like providence, right? And, and we don't always find them writing about Jesus, which is is really more reflection that people have not read their writings as much as they think, because the word Jesus appeared in many of their writings multiple times. But you do have some individuals that, you, like Washington people say, well, you don't really find him talking about Jesus very much in his writings. And that's fair. You don't really find him talking about Jesus very much in his writings. However, during the American Revolution, as he was writing about the miracles he was seeing when God protected the military, when God sovereignly protected him where he should have been captured or killed, where the military should have lost. Over 250 times, he talks about God's providence in protecting the military and preserving his life. And the reason this matters is a deist doesn't believe God gets involved in the affairs of men. A deist doesn't believe that God gets involved in the world. A deist, the deistic thought is the clockmaker theory that God wound up the world and then God turned it loose. And it's up to us as individuals to do whatever we want because God's already done his part and he doesn't get involved anymore. Well, none of the founding fathers fall under the category of deist. Now, there were some that we might could argue maybe they weren't Christian, but that's a different conversation because even like Benjamin Franklin, I don't think he was a Christian, and there's several letters I would point to to give evidence of that, but the very letters I would point to that would give evidence he's not a Christian also give evidence of a much deeper faith than most people realize. Yeah, but I think there's a question that goes right along with that. They held a biblical worldview. Big time. You know, whether they lived up to the standards of that or acknowledged Jesus of Nazareth as their personal Lord and Savior— there's really no question that they held a biblical worldview, a Judeo-Christian no worldview. They weren't Buddhist, you know. They, I mean, and and it, it's really um, deceptive, yes. I think, for the critics to say, well, they were deist and discount them big time. 
you know. So, so to that end, a couple of great letters from Franklin. There was one letter that Franklin wrote to, um, I think it was the Reverend uh, Dean Woodward is who this letter was to, but Franklin wrote him and Franklin was a diplomat over in Europe during the American Revolution. And so he spent a lot of time in, in England, a lot of time in France. And while he was over there, uh, and this is where he writes the letter back. He says, I've noticed that when I'm in France and England, he says, anytime I quote the scripture, he says, people over here, they never know what I'm talking about when I quote the scripture because they're not familiar with it. He says, but in New England, he says, I never have to tell anybody when I quote scripture. I never have to give a reference for what I quote because everybody knows the scripture in New England. Now that's Franklin. And, and, and I could point to literally dozens of his letters where if you start reading his letter, he just starts quoting verse after verse after verse after verse. Today, people don't see that connection. And usually it's because we don't really study their actual writings. But number two, we also don't really know the Bible well enough to even sometimes recognize all of those occurrences that are there. But the point is that even for a guy like Franklin, Franklin recognized a major difference between America and England was in America, everybody knew the Bible and you don't have to tell people when you're quoting the Bible. And the, the bigger point I would make with Franklin, even the foundation of faith in his life, the end of his life, that about three months before he died, uh, the president of Yale University, Ezra Stiles, wrote Franklin a letter and he asked him, about his faith, specifically, uh, what do you think about Jesus? Do you believe he's the son of God? And he said, I, I don't mean to be offensive in asking this question. Um, he says, I, I, I wish everybody were as I am in my belief in Jesus and my love for God and that relationship and connection. And not for my faults, but he said, I just, I want people to experience the same thing I've had. And I just wonder if what you think about that. Franklin writes him a letter back and Franklin says, it's not offensive at all. He says, but actually nobody's really ever asked me that before. Now that's also astounding because Franklin was personal friends with George Whitfield, most famous evangelist in the first great awakening. But if you study history, what you also realize is at that point in especially early America, every denomination was so heavy Calvinistic bent, even in Whitfield's teachings, that when Whitfield was giving so many of his sermons, very seldom did he talk about Jesus or salvation. It was much about who God was and the sovereignty of God and the power of God. It was a very different thought or feel. So Franklin says, nobody's ever asked me about my position with Jesus. He said, this would take serious contemplation, which I've never put in the study. He says, what I can tell you, my belief has been from the very beginning of my life is that there is one God, the creator of the universe. He rewards the good. He punishes the wicked. He's given us the Holy Bible, both the Old and New Testament of divine inspiration for us to live our lives and that he will reward us in this life and in the next for the way we conduct ourselves. He said, as to if Jesus is truly divine or just a great moral teacher, he says, I don't know, but at my age, I will shortly find out. And he concludes the letter by a couple of sentences to the pastor. Now what's also, I, I tell people in, in a little hope, right? It's, it's, it's very possible in those last three months, the Holy Spirit's like, hey, you should look into Jesus, right? It's totally possible Franklin, right. Franklin comes to discover Jesus as his Lord and Savior. But the point is, even Franklin says, he believes there's a God who created the universe. He rewards the righteous, he punishes the wicked, that he has given the Old and New Testament by divine inspiration, that he will reward us for the works we do in this life and reward us in eternity. This is not someone who is very skeptical of the beliefs and teachings of Christianity. And Franklin actually tells him at the end of this letter, please don't tell anybody what I'm telling you. He says, because I've worked to be on good grounds, but I have so many friends that are pastors and I print all their sermons and I wouldn't want them to think less of me because I'm not sure about Jesus. Well, again, that's very different than this accusation that when, when people accuse the founding fathers of being deists, again, Franklin's the only guy who ever self-ascribed to being a deist and he left that belief in his youth is what he says. But what they're usually trying to do is discount the influence of faith in their life. And back to your point, that the foundation of faith is really unquestionable if you start looking into their writings, if you start looking into the early state constitutions, the early policies they wrote for their state. It's just that today we don't study history, number one. And number two, we don't know the Bible. So that even if we studied history, we wouldn't always recognize how many biblical ideas they were including in what they did. Well, and I, I, what I hope the people listening will grapple with is how disingenuous it is when those arguments are pushed forward, mm -hmm. that we don't have that Christian heritage because they really weren't Christians. You know, you're, you're putting a standard to bear that wouldn't pass the test today. If we collected randomly 100 pastors from Middle Tennessee, 
uh, there's going to be a significant percentage that wouldn't pass the orthodox test right? if we use a biblical worldview and holding to those standards of Scripture. So trying to discount our heritage of those founders and the founding documents based on the deism argument to me is just completely disingenuous. It is. You know, were they all orthodox believers in Jesus? No, they weren't. But they all held, or the overwhelming majority of them held clearly a biblical worldview. Well, and back up to the 56 signers of the Declaration, 29 of them graduated from Bible schools and seminaries in, in their day. And, right, so again, this idea that they, it was a collective group of irreligious secular people, it's so ridiculous. Uh, one of the signers of the Declaration, John Witherspoon, was actually a pastor in Scotland. He was recruited to come to America by two other founding fathers, James Wilson and Benjamin Rush. He was recruited to come to America because at the time they needed a new president for Princeton University. And at that time, you could not have a president of a university who wasn't a pastor. Right. And so they found a pastor. <clears throat> from the belief in that denomination and they recruited him to come to America. Well, not only does he come to America, <clears throat> excuse me, and become the, the president of Princeton University, he becomes a pastor. And as a pastor, he, he's actually a pastor at the time he signs the declaration. So he's the only one who was an active pastor at the time he signed. There were other signers who ended up being chaplains in the American Revolution, did other things in the gospel ministry, but he was an actual pastor at the time he signed. In the painting done, the depiction of the Declaration, where the, the, the founding fathers are there at the table, the, the, the presentation of the Declaration is what it's known as, he's actually wearing his clerical collar. So it's actually in the picture he's a pastor, but he's one of many examples. Today, most people have never even heard of his name. And I could go literally around the, the room in that painting telling the names of who they are and what they did. And if we actually knew who they were, to your point— the vast majority, not, not all of them, I would argue, were Christian, but the vast majority were. Of the 56 signers of the Declaration, at the time of the signing, 55 of them were attending Orthodox churches. Well, again, I think it, it's a reminder of how far we have drifted. Mm -hmm. Because when the nation was founded and those documents were put together, the overwhelming influence came from that biblical mm -hmm. worldview. You know, it's, it's unimaginable to me today. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we had a constitutional convention, we're going to redraft the Constitution. And we made it so overwhelmingly, the people contributing to it came from oh, so overwhelmingly from a biblical worldview, or God forbid we actually ask a pastor to come participate. They'd be screaming separation of church and state. Right. right. And I mean, just from what you've shared already, it's, it's abundantly clear that they had no intention of the church being separate from the values no. of the state or the practice of the state. Correct. In fact, when Congress first assembles, when, when we became uh, our own nation in 1776, we separated from England, but it's not until 1787 that we write the Constitution. It's 11 years later. And then George Washington is sworn in 1789. Well, during this time, the, the first Congress meets in 1789, and they've been commissioned to coming up with the Bill of Rights. What's significant about this is the very first speaker of the house was Frederick Muhlenberg. But Frederick Muhlenberg was the Reverend Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, who'd been a pastor in New York and then was a pastor in Pennsylvania. He, he literally is a speaker of the house when they're drafting the Bill of Rights. So he's the one overseeing this whole thing. Well, his brother was also there, John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, who also was a pastor. There, there's a dozen pastors in the first Congress and they were elected to the first Congress because their constituents recognize these are the voices we weren't representing us. And so when they draft the Bill of Rights, when they're drafting the first amendment, this notion of separation of church and state is so bogus that the very reason that Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg got involved in government in the first place, he was a pastor in New York in 1777. And the British at this time were already recognizing the influence of pastors in America, that pastors were the ones stirring up a lot of patriots and saying, hey, God has given you the right of self-defense, of self-preservation and private property. And you need to protect these things. And so the British were targeting pastors in many of the towns where they would go. And it was a common practice, even at that point, that they would burn churches down when they would take a town to really kind of let pastors know you've gone the wrong direction. Well, he was in New York City when the British came to New York City. There were 19 churches in New York City. They burned 10 to the ground. They destroyed the other nine. He watched as they burned his church to the ground. And at that point, he had an epiphany that I need to get involved because at that point he thought, you know what? It hasn't really affected me, right? I've been able to preach Jesus and I've been fine. But once they burned his church That's down, familiar. oh yeah, maybe a little COVID flashback for some people, right? When, when the government came, and said, You're, we're not gonna let you preach anymore. All of a sudden he said, then I need to get involved. Well, when he gets involved in the first amendment, it talks about that Congress shall not make a law prohibiting your free exercise of religion. 
Well, well, that's what Congress did when they came and they burned his church down and said, you, you can't meet anymore. That, that was their free exercise of religion. But the point is that when these guys got together, their idea was not to make a secular America. Their idea was to separate the government where it could never control the church or control religion, but it wasn't to secularize the government because they recognized even in the Bible, where did the law come from? It came from God given to Moses. God was a part of government. It's just that government and the church were different institutions, right? Where in, in the Bible, Moses was over the government, Aaron was over the temple, over the church. They're separate institutions, but both of them are getting laws from God. That was the founding father's view was separate institutions, but not secular institutions, which is very clear if you go back and see the very guys who even gave us the Bill of Rights. Absolutely. I mean, the, the history is so clear, it screams at us. <clears throat> yeah. And I think we ignore it because it has some real implications for us today. You know, if, if our government is increasingly authoritarian and minimizes the role of our faith mm -hmm. in its exercise of authority, it can only happen because those of us who say we're Christians haven't asserted our right for that faith to be a part of our government. Yeah. So it's really more on our heads than it is our founders. We're the ones who have wandered into the weeds. Our founders were far more orthodox than most of us are. Yeah, and the... To, to the point of being more orthodox, they were so much more practical in the application of their faith, where in, in the modern Christian movement, we have we have so emphasized a conversion form of Christianity that we've neglected the discipleship in Christianity and recognizing that right so when- tell, tell, I, I know what you mean, but amplify that a little bit. A conversion form of Christianity, meaning you say the sinner's prayer, you get dipped in the pool, and now you're on your own. Well, yeah, the, the most important thing is we have to win people to Jesus. We have to make make more converts. And so the goal becomes conversion. But the problem is when you make the goal conversion, then the goal is the finish line. And once you've crossed the finish line, then you did your job. And so the, right, the most important thing right now is what so many pastors even will tell their people, hey, just bring your friends and I'll lead them to Jesus. Well, right, not to be overly offensive to anybody, but the Bible talks about there's a five-fold ministry and it was to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And the, the church is to equip the saints so the saints can go out and do ministry. And so, right, I mean, every pastor ought to be telling people, if your friends haven't heard about Jesus from your lips and you're probably not doing something right, because Amen. that is part of what, we are we are supposed to be disciples and go make disciples. Well, conversion is a part of the discipleship process. But the reason all this matters, when Jesus said, go make disciples, he said, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Well, the word of God applies to everything we do. We know in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that, that, that all scriptures give them inspiration of God. And if you go to verse 17, it tells us that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's to help us for every good work God's called us to do. Well, that means the word of God applies to everything we do. It applies to us if we are the spouse, if we are the son or the daughter, if we are the husband or the wife, if we are the employer or the employee, right? If we are the friend, it implies to us if we are the teacher or the professor, if we are the lawyer or the doctor, the word of God applies to everything we do. But in modern Christianity, if the goal is just conversion, then it's not about applying the word of God to how we live our life. And for the founding fathers, their goal was, how can we apply the word of God to what we do? And, and a lot of this even goes back to, to their foundation because for them, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, when they came to America, they were seeking religious freedom and liberty. That's why right, the vast majority of colonists came to America. So you can go back to the pilgrims, for example. The pilgrims came seeking religious freedom and liberty. And when they came, Governor Bradford talked about that there would be days they would spend six to eight hours a day in the Bible searching the Bible for truth and answers for how they should live and govern their lives. So, so they're not just reading it for a spiritual to-do checklist, right? I've done my quiet time today. They're literally reading going, okay, we're, we're forming a new nation. How do we do this? Because when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they'd been slaves for 400 years. And God says, I'm going to give you a new standard for how to do things. And God ends up giving them 613 commands in the Old Testament. And all of it was how to live life differently. The Bible is absolutely a life manual for how to govern the life God's called us to live. And in the modern Christian era, we have so discounted the practical application of the word of God. We, we've discounted the notion of discipleship. And therefore we have sat back where we should have been involved in government because we've been stewards, almost like in Luke 19, where the master told the servants, you are in charge until I return. We're the ones that are in charge of Republican government, right? And this, this Democrat, Republican constitutional form of government, we're the ones with the vote and the say, but if we sit back 
And we're the servant who says, well, master, I knew you were hard. <laughs> and so I buried my talent, but here I brought back. If, if we don't get involved, well, we know how it went for that servant. It wasn't well, but this is what's happened for so long. And so it, it's really taken for so many people the last couple of years for it to be a wake up call. This, this siren that people are realizing what we have enjoyed and apathy for so long can be lost because we've been apathetic if we don't get involved because everybody in the entire world has God-given rights, everybody. Mm -hmm. You have God-given rights in China. You have God-given rights in North Korea. You have God-given rights in Russia, but you can't enjoy those God-given rights if they're not politically protected. So what made America so special for so long is the Bill of Rights politically protected so many of our God-given rights, the freedom of worship, the freedom of speech, the, the freedom of assembly, the, the freedom to petition, the, 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 the right of self-preservation and self-defense, the right of private property. Those are all God-given rights, but if they're not politically protected, then you lose those. And we are now at a place where seeing those lost. And, and I think part of the foundation comes back to the more secular we become, the more we will lose those rights because if there is no God, there can be no God-given rights. So when Christians don't get involved, it minimizes God, therefore it minimizes God-given rights. And there's only two options for a nation. You either have a big God or a big government. And if Christians don't get involved, it minimizes God, therefore you have a bigger government and the bigger your government gets, then the government's the one that tells you where you can go and what you can do and where you can work. This is the reality. It becomes God. This is it. Because there's only two options, the big God or big government. Right. And for so much of our nation, we knew that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, right? That, that we, we knew where our provision, where our help came from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, not from the government, but now we have looked to government to be our supplier, our provider, the meter of our needs, et cetera. And again, a lot of it goes back to the absence of Christians getting involved in the process, but also even the lack of recognition of the, even the role of the church in how Christians should engage in the civil process, but the same thing with economics or business or medicine, education across the board. We've just been disengaged for so long. It's allowed this problem to, to really fester. We have, but we're changing. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I want to clear a couple things up just so we don't give our adversaries any necessary clubs. I th we both believe in conversion, salvation, the new birth. Absolutely. As essential to participation in the kingdom of God. But that is the initiation point. It's the beginning point. We want to grow up in the Lord, and that takes a lifetime of discipleship. The and starting blocks and of the race. So we then can run the race with perseverance that's set before us. Absolutely. But I want to pivot a little bit. You've opened the door, and I want to let, let's, let's walk through it a little further. Um, having to do with our faith today. Because I've, I've done a series of pastors' conferences across the country and encouraging pastors to tell the truth to their congregations about current events, not to advocate for parties or candidates, but to talk about our culture and what it would look like to live out a biblical worldview in this mm -hmm. culture, the things that we cannot cooperate with or that we have to stand in opposition to. We don't hate people, but we <clears throat> hate ungodliness. Mm -hmm. and, and what it's really is exposed is the degree to which our faith has deteriorated. Yeah. You know, in, in in many of our churches, we're unwilling to even talk about um, objective truth. And we'll say, you know, we're being political. Right. It's not political no. to say that sin is still sin. Correct. And so I, I know your, your platform is used by churches all over the country. Mm -hmm. Let the listeners hear a little bit about what you're saying, that, that it's not bad to talk mm -hmm. about culture in the midst of our faith discussion. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we will point to is if you go back to <clears throat> the first and second great awakening uh, as as— primary examples. If you look at the first and second great awakening, um, in those times, there was moral crisis in America, S significant moral crisis. In fact, it, it, we'll start with the second great awakening. In the second great awakening, every single major denomination in America split during the second great awakening over the issue of slavery. Well, it's because people were debating the issue of slavery. There was a major moral crisis of even for Christians, yes, slavery is is allowed. It's biblical. God endorsed it. No, it's not God's design or intent. That's part of the fall. That's not what God wanted. God made us to be free, the law of nature. This debate was going back and forth. But what's interesting- Excuse me, but wasn't it the moral clarity from that awakening that gave us the courage to face the civil war? A hundred percent. Same thing with the revolution. That first great awakening gave us the moral clarity to find our independence? Unquestionably. It was, it was the debates over truth and morality that, that were necessary debates. But 
what's interesting looking back is not everybody was on the right side. And, and, and even the great awakenings, they weren't kumbaya moments. The, the, the great awakenings, the vast majority of them were incredible division. You go back to the first great awakening at George Whitfield being the, the, the main leader of the first great awakening. George Whitfield was not allowed to speak in most churches for the first two plus decades of his ministry, more than 20 years. Pastors wouldn't let him in because part of his message was a message that we need to ignore denominations and we need to all just be the body of Christ. And at this time, uh, when, when the founding fathers got together, there were 13 colonies and in nine of the colonies, there were state established denominations. And so you had Catholic, you had Episcopalian, you had uh, Anglican, you had a Congregationalist, you had Quakers, but you had state established denominations and they didn't all get along very well. And, and in fact, they persecuted each other in Whitfield he, it was a famous dream he had. And actually there's really fun letters from John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, several founding fathers where they talked about, this was their favorite sermon that Whitfield would deliver. He said that he had a, a dream that he went to heaven. And when he went to heaven, Father Abraham met him at the door and he said, Father Abraham, where are my Methodist brethren? And Abraham looked at him and said, there are no Methodists in heaven. And he said, no Methodists made it to heaven. He said, where, where are my Wesleyan brothers? And he said, there are no Wesleyans in heaven. And, and he starts going through every denomination, right? He goes to the Baptists and the Episcopalian, the Anglicans. And finally, he looks at Father Abraham and says, Father Abraham, then, then who makes it into heaven? And he says, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness shall be approved by him, which is quoting from Acts. He said, and this is in the sermon, Whitfield says, God help us to forget our titles and to focus on what is truly important. Amen. But what is significant about this is that this was not a message well received in the vast majority of the colonies. And so there are accounts <clears throat> where pastors would literally tell their congregation to, to take objects, to throw at him, to try to drive him out of their community. That There is a, a pastor who actually encouraged, Whitfield was under a, a big oak tree in shade out in a field. And a pastor told somebody from his congregation to get up and to go urinate and defecate on Whitfield to try to drive him out. Like literally, Whitfield preached for 34 years in America. Uh, he had 18, delivered over 18,000 sermons in those 34 years in America, which is an astounding rate of communication. Uh, and it's estimated that 80% of Americans physically heard him speak. So it's amazing. Remarkable for lots and lots of reasons. Well, it wasn't until the last 10. You have a website. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, no microphones, no amplification, no social media, no TV, no YouTube. But with this being said, it wasn't until the last 10 years or so that other pastors finally started when he would come to town, they would welcome him. They'd invite their congregation. It took more than 20 years, but it was through this turmoil, through this frustration, through the persecution before it finally began to turn. And what he was doing was addressing issues that were morally relevant and that were true and, and things that were true based on what the Bible said, that, that, that what well, the Bible gives indication on these morals. Well, the second great awakening is no different. You, you look at Charles Finney, who was one of the major leaders in second great awakening. Charles Finney was the founder of Oberlin College. One of his requirements for students at Oberlin College was they were required to participate in the Underground Railroad. As a requirement for going to college, well, it was part of an activization of their faith. You, you, your faith needs to be activated, you, right? Your faith and works need to go together in this. So he said, we have to do something with our faith. But this was something quite significant because you talk about morally contentious when you have the fugitive slave law and you have the underground railroad and there's a lot of turmoil in America. Well, in the midst of this, you, you also recognize that Finney was a guy that in one year of his ministry, it's estimated that more than 100,000 people converted to Christianity under the ministry of, of Charles Finney. So God used him in amazing ways. But with this being said, it, it was an incredibly contentious time. And I think so often in America, we have this idea of revivals as being a really unifying time when historically revivals are not unifying. Re revivals ended up producing very positive results, where at the end of the first great awakening, it led to the American Revolution, which led to more freedom, stability, prosperity, and equality than anywhere the world had ever seen. At the end of the second great awakening, it led to the Civil War, where again, truth and morality prevail because slavery is ended, there's freedom, there's equality, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment that are enacted, positive things are happening. But the reason I, I even bring all this up is there are so many pastors right now who are praying for revival and they think the way revival happens is to preach message that only talk about unity without recognizing 
that, that even Jesus said, right? He didn't come to bring unity. He came ultimately with truth, but truth was going to divide. And when pastors are are unwilling to say things that they agree are biblically true. And this is this is where the challenge is. There are pastors who agree. Well, yeah, the Bible says this, but we wouldn't want to offend people by saying that. We have people in our congregation that feel a different way. When, when pastors are more concerned about hurting someone's feelings than they are about teaching what the Bible says, then th- they have misunderstood their role as a pastor. Amen, brother. But, uh, you know, when you... You do such a beautiful job of reminding the listeners of our history. And when you start to tell the story, it, it just keeps highlighting for me the degree to which our faith has deteriorated. I mean, into our churches and into the pulpits, because we have, we've made the 11th commandment, thou shalt be kind. And mm-hmm. we talk about that Jesus loved everybody, and we're reluctant to identify sin because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You can't have a revival unless you're willing to say there is sin and that right. our behavior is aberrant. The, the, the point of the revival isn't to tell the pagans to get saved. The point of the revival is to tell God's people they need to repent and change their patterns. And if we're going to maintain our freedom and liberty, it's not about the pagans. It's about God's people changing their way of behavior in the 21st century. Correct. And that's not a new thing. That's how our nation came into existence. That's how our nation has made every significant step forward through our history by God's people changing their hearts and coming back to the Lord. Correct. So the question, it seems to me, on the table is, are we going to have the courage in the 21st century to acknowledge that our faith has deteriorated and we have a form of godliness, but we've denied the power of it? Mm -hmm. And will we have a heart change? And that, that's not always going to bring unity. That's not we're, we're going to get disinvited. We're going to have people unhappy with us. We don't have to be angry in return, but we're going to have to be determined and persevere. We've done that since our nation began. In fact, you know, you mentioned the founding fathers and the pilgrims. They, before they got here, many of them had had their possessions confiscated. Correct. They had suffered enormous losses. It's why they valued that freedom. Mm-hmm. Now, we've had just a tiny little taste of that. Buildings closed, offices closed, schools closed. Are we going to value our faith enough to believe that we can make a change? Well, the optimism and the encouragement I want to give is I think we are actually in the middle of a third great awakening right now. Because if you look, right, first and second great awakening, it, it wasn't times of peace and unity. It was times of frustration. It, it was times of unrest. There was political divides, but what happened is there were debates over truth and morality. We, <laughs> arguably, we didn't think 20 or 30 years ago we were going to have to have debates over what a boy or a girl was, but we are literally having debates over truth and morality. By members of the Supreme Court. <laughs> it's so crazy, but we are seeing people awakened. And if you go back to the American Revolution as, as, as another, to me, easy example, so often people get discouraged looking at the nation because they see the big problems and they don't feel like we have the numbers to win the battles. And sometimes even looking at elections, man, I don't know if we have you know 50 or 60% to win these elections. But the reality is, if you look at the American Revolution, Great Britain was the number one military power in the world at that time. And we were British citizens, so we didn't have our own military. So when we separated, we had to form our own military. And we were really like farmers and school teachers and shopkeepers. And we, we had some ships, but we, we didn't have our own navy. So we had to make our own navy. So we were this ragtag army. And if you look from the American perspective, only 25% of the Americans joined the Patriot cause on any level whatsoever. But by joining the Patriot cause, some of it was just more of a verbal auditory joining. Like, yes, we agree with you guys. It, estimates are it's only eight or nine or 10% of Americans that actually fought for liberty in the American revolution. Now, why that matters is- Let me say it again, 10%. It was less than engaged. 10% actually fought okay. on the Patriot side in the American Revolution, right? So George Washington's army, I mean, tiny in comparison in the support they had, but what's significant, and we know as Christians, right? It's not about the numbers. When when Gideon amassed his army and God's like, oh, that's way too many, right? 30,000, let's narrow that down. 10,000, let's, uh, 300, we can do that. God's never needed the majority for victory. But what's interesting is mm-hmm. when you're looking at 10% from the American revolution, 10% of Americans fighting in favor of liberty, it, it doesn't take the majority. It takes a determined minority 
who has the courage and boldness to stand up and keep going and promoting and fighting when along those lines, if you look at, at, at where we are today with even some of the sexual revolution that we're living in now, well, back up 20 years when the homosexual community was less than 1%. How in the world is it now all over every television show and all over media? Well, because they were so dedicated and they were so vocal. It doesn't take a majority to change things. It takes a dedicated minority who won't back down. And in the American Revolution, also worth noting, there were over 250 battles in the revolution. George Washington was only a part of 17. He only won six battles. George Washington lost almost every battle. In fact, the, the Americans lost the vast majority of battles. But the reason we won the war is because we kept fighting and kept fighting and we didn't give up until the war was won. And, and this is where I do think it comes back to, I, I think we are in a third grade awakening. I, I, we're seeing people all over the nation because I get to travel. I know you travel as a lot as well. But one of the things that I think we have a, a privilege of seeing that a lot of maybe the, the listeners right now don't is we get to see people all over the nation that are waking up, many of them That's who- true who were disinvolved in church, were disinvolved in government. Now, now parents are showing up to school board meetings and these parents have never been to a school board meeting their whole life, but all of a sudden they noticed what was happening to their kids and they said, we're gonna get involved in education. We are seeing God wake people up all over this nation. And this to us has a very similar feel to what happened in the first and second great awakening. And, and, and I'm gonna give a verse. I was thinking about this just a minute ago when you talked about, are we gonna have the courage to stand up in Revelation 21, 8, as uh, the apostle John is closing Revelation, when I was a kid, I learned Revelation 21, 8. There was a song about liars going to hell. And that was a song that I learned. And that's what I knew about Revelation 21, 8. And it, it, it's, it never ceases to amaze me how no matter how many times you go through the Bible, you can read something and God can show you something brand new you've never seen before that just this rhema word blows your mind. Like, okay, had no idea. Well, Revelation 21, eight, when, when all this COVID stuff started happening, this was something that God just revealed to us in an incredible way at Wall Builders. Revelation 21, eight, it says, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The list of who all is going to have a part of that second death, the lake with the response fire and brimstone, virtually everyone is there for what they did wrong, except the very first ones listed are the cowardly. Mm. They're there not for doing something wrong, but for not having the courage to do what was right. So to do nothing is to make a choice. Correct. To be silent is actually to be willing to support evil. And Silence weakness. in the face of evil is itself evil. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you to pray for that next Great Awakening before we go. But my guest today is Tim Barton. And if you're not familiar with wall builders, you need to be. Parents or grandparents, if you have children or grandchildren, they've got some great resources to help with that. The rest of us, educate yourself. If you don't know our history, you're doomed to, to be manipulated by people that will give you half the truth. We have a heritage as a Christian nation, not a uniquely Christian nation but a nation with a unique Christian heritage. And if we relinquish that, we will yield to the authoritarian, totalitarian voices that we see on the horizon right now. It's an exciting time to be a Christ follower. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Tim, you're amazing. I, I feel you, like I, I've studied history most of my life, and I feel like a beginner when we sit down. <laughs> Thank you for your faithfulness and your voice and your persistence. I heard your dad in Murfreesboro 30 years ago. Wow. At another church. And I sat there just grinned through the whole, I'll never forget it. I remember where I was sitting at his recitation of the history and his determination to tell that story. And now you're another generation into that. And you are a light in this nation. And I thank you for thank it. Thank you. So how about a prayer yes. for that next great awakening? Huh? Yes. Well, God, we thank you so much that you have given us truth. Jesus, that you are truth, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, God, that we know that in you, that we can find freedom because that truth brings freedom. We know the truth and the truth sets us free. God, I ask that you would help us as Christians. God, to not compromise truth, but recognize that as truth brings freedom and truth is found in God and Jesus, the truth is found in your word. God, that you would put in us a hunger and thirst for righteousness, that we would want even more of your word. Jesus, we'd want even more of you. Amen. God, that we'd want to connect with you even more. And Lord, as we connect with you even more, 
God, that you would pour in us, through us, and out of us, that you would use us to pour into those around us. God, that you would give us the courage to to speak the truth in love, to love people enough, to love our friends enough, to let them know if they're doing something that is not pleasing to you. God, to love our family enough, to love our kids enough, to, to... in love, tell them the truth of your word, but God, help us to discover truth in your word. Help us to have the courage and boldness to stand up and speak truth. And God, give us even the courage and boldness to become a light in our sphere of influence, in our world where we work. God, with the friends we're in Bible study and small group with, God, even if it's a school board or city council or government, God, help us to be disciples and apply your word in everything we do. And Lord, may we be a part of this third great awakening. And at the end of this awakening, May truth and morality prevail. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. And may God bless America again. 